Aging is the biggest risk factor for chronic disease. I mean, that's really the bottom line. And more than chronic disease, it's the biggest risk factor for acute disease as well, for COVID, for influenza, et cetera, et cetera. As we age, our risk for developing those diseases just rises exponentially. And once we develop one of them, one begets another, begets another, begets another. And it's a slippery slope to spending the final decades on the planet sick. Anybody listening to this is not planning for their final 20 years to be really sick. That's not how we're hardwired to think at all. And yet that is the trajectory for us, unless we very intentionally choose to live a different life. Well, hello there. I'm Dr. Kate Henry. And today on the Root Cause Medicine podcast, we're talking with Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. She's an incredible clinician and researcher who's published the book, Younger You. I absolutely adore this book. It's about easy, practical, affordable ways to reverse your biological age and amplify your health all based on the evidence. You will love today's conversation if you're someone who's interested in living as long as possible, as healthfully as possible for the sake of you and your loved ones. These tips that she's gonna talk about are not only feasible for adults to do, but can be done for the whole family. I know you'll love today's episode, and if you're a clinician who wants to be trained in the Younger You Method, great news, Dr. Kara is offering one in partnership with Rupa Health for free. February 14th and February 15th of 2024. We'll have the link in the show notes, but this will help arm you with the tools, the handouts, all the strategies you need to take the easy, awesome tips from Dr. Kara and her team and implement them into your clinic successfully so that your clients can heal and thrive. Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. It's great to be with you. It always, it's nice to hang out with you here. Absolutely. So um, I know you and pretty much everyone in the functional medicine space knows about you because of your amazing podcast, your incredible book, your awesome studies. But for our podcast listeners who are meeting you for the first time, can you tell us who you are, what you do, and yeah, a little bit about what you stand for? Sure. I am a naturopathic physician by training. I did specialized postdoctorate training in laboratory science. And I think that sort of set the stage for my career. So I both practice clinical medicine, specifically functional medicine, and I'm on faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine. But I also really embrace lab technology and I'm pretty excited about kind of the next generation lab technology that that's coming to the fore. That's just something that's extremely important to me. And as I'm saying this, Kate, it's funny because obviously this is why we have such a, a good synergy, a natural synergy. So when I was at the lab, we were kind of an early omics lab, organic acids, fatty acids, amino acids, et cetera. And we started to look at DNA and measure SNPs and so forth. The things that are pretty routine for us now in functional medicine but when we started to be able to measure what genes are on and off in this whole field of epigenetics, epi above genetics, the gene. So when we, when we started to have access to that, I was really, really excited about it. In fact, even before then, I started to put a lot of attention on the science coming out. So when it was still in the research setting, I could see that measuring what genes are being turned on and off and how we influence that. In fact, that interface between the epigenome and the genome is all about our environmental influences turning genes on and off. I mean, it just struck me, and this is really going 10 years, actually, maybe 11 now, probably 2013 is when I started. It just struck me as something fundamentally important to our space, to what you're calling root cause medicine or functional medicine, like incredibly important. And, you know, that shaped my work. We developed a program around optimizing epigenetics, around using the interventions that we're going to dive into around, can we actually tweak gene expression? And so, as you know, we were able to do that. We were given funding to actually study our intervention, but it was the first time that we were able to demonstrate a diet and lifestyle intervention in humans in a controlled study. I mean, controlled study structure would radically influence the rate of aging. So yeah, it was a big, it was kind of a big deal. And I'll be quiet because I'm just introducing myself now. So I guess what I want to say is that I just look at the trajectory of my career from being steeped in 
naturopathic medicine in school, and then moving into the high-tech world of laboratory science, layering in functional medicine. And of course, Dr. Jeff Bland was, has been a mentor to me all along that journey. I went to school out in his neck of the woods in the Pacific Northwest. And so all of this background really enabled me to, you know, kind of think about gene expression through the functional lens and then actually get to research it. And it's, you know, just been career changing, just really, really exciting, really cool stuff. And I look forward to talking to you about kind of where we're headed with that as well. But now I'll stop because that's just the intro. <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to talk for a while because there's so much to talk about. But something that really struck me about you, and it came through in your book as well, is how much you really care about people. Like you really care about people. You really care about your clients and helping them live lives that are free of diseases, chronic illnesses, suffering. And it's not like just because you're a scientist or just because you're into the technology and data that you became interested in epigenetics. To me, it really was clear through your book that it was because you started asking the question, how do I really do better for my clients? How do I use food and lifestyle and the things that nature gave us in a very strategic way that's actually like democratizes access to this material? It's not super expensive. It's not a pill, but how do I really use tools to actually significantly change people's health? And then how do I measure it and prove it? And your book is just like a complete celebration of that. And it's, it's rare. So it's rare for a doctor to also be a researcher and your two studies. I'd love to start there. Like the two studies that I read of yours recently that came out in the past four years demonstrated that it was possible to reverse age, and we'll talk about which type of age, by up to four years in just two months of changing the type of foods people were eating and how they were moving and how they were sleeping. That is phenomenal. And I just want to like, thank you for doing that, first of all. And then I want to ask you, like, let's drill into that a bit. When we say reversing age, what do we mean? It seems like there's two types of aging. Can you tell our listeners what are the two types and which one can you actually reverse and why would it matter for your health? Yeah. So there's chronological age, the birthdays we've celebrated, and we can't do anything about that. It's a number based on the amount of time we've, we've been here. And it's a number whose time is going to end soon, I think, in terms of influence and, you know, really caring about it. We're moving into this age, no pun intended, this, this age, this era of really appreciating biological age. That is the rate that we're aging at. And that, again, is how well we're living our lives and really seeing there's just a ton of evidence for the fact that we sit in the driver's seat of that by and large. You know, we influence how well and how long we live by the choices that we're making every day. And this is called biological age. And this is tissue wear and tear, cellular wear and tear, organ wear and tear, all of that. And so our study was the first one, the one done in men. And then you're referencing last year's study done, a case series done in women. Both of those were first of their kind publications demonstrating that a diet and lifestyle, you know, combined intervention in a very short period of time, an intense intervention in a short period of time could make a difference in the rate of aging. Yeah, it's really exciting. And again, to your point, it's a diet and lifestyle intervention. It's not plasma exchange. It's not stem cell treatments in Panama. It's down to earth. You can get it in the perimeter of any grocery. Yeah. So, okay, let's take an example. So let's talk about Jane. She has been on the planet for 59 years. So if you ask her how old she is, she's going to say 59 years old. But she wants to know her biological age. How would she find that out? She'd call Rupa <laughs> or email you guys. Again, when I first started on this journey, we didn't have access to these tests. When we conducted our first trial, it was those tests were only available to us in the research setting. We collected the specimen. We sent them off to the Yale Center for Genealogical Research, and they processed our specimen and then just gave us reams and reams and reams of data. Now we can work with clinical labs, you know, labs that are available to us as doctors and labs that are actually available to the consumer as well. So somebody just wanting to do this on their own without a physician interface can in fact measure their biological age. And I will say there's a lot of tests out there and maybe we can spend a little time talking about which I think are most reliable and most evidence-informed. And I'll just 
get it out right now, the one that we're currently using in our practice and in our research is the pace of aging, what we call a third generation biological age clock. Let's dive into that because I think a lot of folks think, well, I could never afford to figure out my biological age. I, I kind of see what people are doing in the media and this is all people with tons of money and it seems like their whole life is about reversing their age. What are we actually measuring with the test you're using? Is it telomere length? What is it? Well, it's looking at a collection, a suite of methylation sites. So again, going back to epigenetics, it's measuring a collection of one of the chief epigenetic marks, something called DNA methylation. There's about 30 million of them are in our total genome. There's a ton of these little methyl groups. It's a carbon and three hydrogens, and they sit at specific points on the base pairs of our DNA. And the pace of aging, the clock that I'm using, and really most of the clocks today are using some kind of a collection of these methylation sites. When we were conducting our study, we paid about $1,200 per test. We paid a lot. Yeah. And that was discounted and all of that. We paid a ton. That was by far the most expensive element of our research study. That test today, I think is what, I think it's $200. So it's massively dropped in spend and it's really the best one available currently. That's awesome. We're going to dig more into like the science of measuring and, and also you've developed some some surveys that people can take for free. So let's start with that. And then I want to circle back to kind of drilling into like, what is methylation? Just so we don't lose folks as we begin to talk about the epigenome and methylation. But I want to talk about the fact that, again, because you're so committed to making this accessible to everybody, it's not just, hey, you either get this blood test and you know your biological age or you're out of luck. You've helped people kind of develop tools with just a survey or some regular blood work where they could start to guess where they're at. Yeah, I'm glad that you just keep bringing the branch down, Kate. That's awesome because it is, it is what's kind of special about this intervention. It's doable. Yeah, we have a BioAge quiz on our website. I think if you just put in Dr. Kara Fitzgerald BioAge quiz, it'll take you there and we'll make sure that you have the link. And that's a, just a collection of questions that we've given each a weight to. And depending on your answers at the end, we will give you an age estimate. And it's not a validated test. It's based on our best read on the literature. However, I think we currently have enough individuals having taken this test for, and the PACE. So we've got the PACE DNA methylation clock and the BioAge quiz. We're looking at those and seeing if we can find a correlation. So seeing if we can, in fact, see, validate this quiz. It does this quiz track with the PACE data. And if we can, that'll be awesome. You know, we'll continue to build that database. Actually, you guys could probably help us with that, maybe. Like, note to self, note to us. Let's do it. It would be awesome. So that's an easy quiz. It's free. It's in the book. And then it's also on the website. So you don't even have to buy the book. But the book, by the way, is almost always on sale at Amazon now. So it's pretty cheap these days. And you can honestly, if you're really pinching pennies, you can, you can get it used for probably five bucks right now. So it's available online. And the other cool thing that we have at the site is something called the PhenoAge Calculator. And that's really simple blood chemistries that most of us get at least annually when we go to our standard physical exam. And those, and a handful of those, like, um, you know, white blood cell counts on a complete blood count panel or alkaline phosphatase, which is on a, a chemistry, a serum chemistry, standard, standard stuff, a CRP. I think there are nine markers on it, maybe 11 markers. Anyway, there's calculations involved in this. I got it right here. If you're watching on YouTube, y'all, just like page 89, younger you. Things that you can, that your primary care doctor is going to know what they are and can easily order for you and usually is ordering for you as part of a yearly checkup panel, CBC, CMP, just like you said. And then you have a few more like DHEA, A1C, and CRP that might be a little more specialized. Can we talk people through what those three biomarkers are and, and why you feel like they should check those as well? So the PhenoAge quiz is just a CBC, just a chem screen plus a CRP. And then you put it into this calculator that we've got on the website. We'll give you a link to that and that'll pop out a BioAge quiz. That PhenoAge spreadsheet is the origin that the PhenoAge DNA methylation clock, so a, a, a second generation good epigenetic clock is based on these standard lab biomarkers. And so you can get access to that if you happen to have those two labs plus a CRP at our website. 
in that, in the book, the list of labs and lab values that I've put in there are ones that I thought were or are important enough to pay attention to that have an association with the rate of aging. So if you can get to optimal levels with those, if you can get them tested and get to the levels that I recommend in the book, it's associated with a bioage reversal or a bioage slowdown. So cool. And so the folks who are listening are thinking, all right, hang on a second. Why do I want to reverse my biological age? I think you do a really good job of explaining why biological age is connected to chronic illness. So can you explain that to our listeners? Mm -hmm. Sure. So aging is the biggest risk factor for disease, for chronic disease. I mean, that's really the bottom line. And and more than chronic disease, it's the biggest risk, risk factor for acute disease as well, for COVID, for influenza, et cetera, et cetera. As we age, our risk for developing those diseases just rises exponentially. And once we develop one of them, you know, one begets another, begets another, begets another. And it's kind of a, it's a slippery slope to spending the final decades on the planet sick. None of us, you're not sitting here thinking anybody listening to this is not planning for their final 20 years to be really sick. That's not how we're hardwired to think at all. And yet that is the trajectory for us. That is what happens unless we very intentionally choose to live a different life. I mean, it's just extraordinary how clear it is. And along with the chronic diseases come polypharmacy. So, be, you know, being reliant on multiple medications, being reliant on doctor visits, on specialized care, on hospitalizations, on skilled nursing facilities and so forth. Like, And so then you can sort of, you can see that, that your final years of existence, not just influencing your quality of life, if you're present to be able to recognize it, given that Alzheimer's is one of the top chronic diseases that we deal with in our country, but your family, we don't have a good caregiver system. You know, unless you're very well off, it's our families who carry the burden of having to care for the individual with these illnesses. It's so stressful. It's so stressful and so painful. And I just remember my, my landlady, like neither, both of my parents are healthy now. Actually, I remember my grandmother and my grandfather both, they had, they were in their 90s, but they definitely had, both of them had vascular dementia. My mom is one of eight kids. They had a lot of family to kind of embrace them and they got to stay in their home. I mean, they were lucky to be able to have that experience, even as they were not, you know, cognitively intact. And my mom and, and, and my dad are reasonably healthy, but I look at, you know, my beloved landlady right before I went to medical school, she was in her 90s and slowly sort of giving away her home to the government so that she could afford to have people come in and care for her as she became more and more infirm. And yeah, you know, just losing her independence and losing any kind of inheritance that she wanted to pass down to her kids. Anyway, and that's the journey, you know, that's the journey that we go through if we're lucky, you know, if we're actually lucky enough to have those resources available to us. So what can we do now? You know, because the time is now, to prepare, you know, Peter Atia calls it what the centenarian decathlon or try or something like that. You know, like we really need to hardcore you know, take responsibility for living our best lives now so that we can continue to do what it is that we want to do. So a question that has, has become kind of urgent for me personally, as a mom of a little kid, I started late in life. I feel extremely responsible to living a good life, to be able to be with my my daughter through hers. But it's my responsibility now to do all that I can do to ensure that my later years, my final my final decades, will be you know as strong and full of possibility as I want them to, as I'm envisioning. I love that. So you have kind of a, a few interventions that you use to help people reverse their biological age and basically be as, as biologically healthy as possible so that they're not aging 
faster than they need to. Their body's not breaking down faster than it needs to. Their body's regulating insulin the way that it should. And their risk factor for chronic illness stays really low. And it seems like those three components in your Younger You program are focused on methyl donors, methylation adaptogens, and lifestyle. And so I wanted to start with what is methylation and what are methyl donors and why do we care? (laughs) Starting with methyl donors. Yeah. So methyl donors, it's going back to epigenetics, going back to gene expression, going back to that being the interface of how we live, influencing gene expression, basically influencing whether we're going to develop diseases or not right in here. A key way that we regulate this is through something called DNA methylation. And a methyl group is just a hydrogen and three carbons. And as I said, it sits on, you know, there's millions of them on our DNA. And they they regulate whether certain genes are on and certain genes are off. And we want, as we age, we actually start to turn on bad guy genes, pro-inflammatory genes, the whole phenomenon of inflammaging, you know, all of that starts to come on. Genes that protect us from illness, genes that protect us from cancer, those get turned off, unfortunately. So there's this swap in the aging journey and we start to, our epigenetics gets a little wonky, if you will, and we start to make ourselves vulnerable to developing the diseases when we look at them epigenetically. And so understanding this back when we developed our program, I wanted to figure out how to optimize and even reverse some of those changes that were occurring. Can we help turn off some of those genes that are turned on that are driving disease forward? Can we turn on some of those genes that are inhibited? So methylation in general on the DNA is less robust as we age. We don't do it as much. We don't do it as efficiently. In fact, Beyond that, we actually, like I said, we kind of scramble it up as well. So we're doing it less, we're doing it less efficiently, and we're scrambling it. And so those are the two nutrient components that I became interested in. Methyl donors are foods that will help methylation generally, help us have enough of the nutrients needed to make methylation happen in the body. The methyl donors are foods rich in folate, B12, betaine, Choline. So these are leafy greens. These are beautiful mushrooms. These are nuts and seeds, primarily seeds. This is liver for those of you willing to eat it. It is in capsules, by the way. What else? It's eggs, beets, etc. There's a there's a plethora of these nutrients that have these methyl donors in them. And so we, in our intervention, we loaded people up on these. And we absolutely saw a significant increase in their circulating methylfolate. We saw that we were supporting the methylation cycle without vitamins. I mean, you could take folate and B12, and we'll talk about that later, you know, when to do that and why we didn't do it in our study. But anyway, all of these foods will very holistically support broadly methylation. Methylation's happening. Methylation is doing a ton of things in the body. And worth specifically, I'm specifically talking about it in relation to DNA and gene expression. So those are methyl donors. We want to load the body up with those, load it, load it up. And then it's almost like the, 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 the collection of nutrients that we called methylation adaptogens. And together we call all of these epinutrients for epigenetic nutrients, epinutrients. The methylation adaptogens kind of help direct where methylation goes. So as I said before, when we get older, we're not methylating efficiently, but we have a net loss of methylation and we start putting methyl groups where they shouldn't be. So we turn off protective genes and taking them off of genes that should have them on. So unhealthy pro-inflammatory genes get turned on. this wonkiness. So yes, we need the methyl donors, but then we need these methylation adaptogens to make sure those methyl donors are, the, those methylation groups are going exactly where they need for optimal health. Can you give some examples of methylation adaptogens? Yeah, absolutely. So we know, we know these methylation adaptogens. They're, it's kind of cool that we know them because they've been used time immemorial in traditional diets and medicine the world over. So turmeric, curcumin, green tea, the EGCG and green tea and the other catechins in green tea, rosemary acid from rosemary, Time. All of those herbs in our spice cabinet are epinutrients. It's it's so extraordinary. Garlic. What else? 
luteolin, lutein, quercetin. So these, these, when we're eating colorful fruits and vegetables, sulforaphane and cruciferous, when we're eating cruciferous, when we're eating greens, when we're eating colorful fruits and vegetables, allergic acid, and we're eating them because of this complex collection of information that usually shows up in food as color. It's just, but not always. I mean, there's a lot going on in a, in a well-designed salad, on a fork full of a well-designed salad. There are, you know, hundreds of thousands of really important micronutrients that are directing traffic there. And these, and these epinutrients, these, these adaptogens are part of that. And so when the adaptogens it, are coupled with the donors, we think that that makes DNA methylation happen in a more favorable pattern. And our studies suggest that, both of them, because we didn't net increase methylation, but we rearranged it to something more favorable. So we can see in our intervention at baseline, there was one pattern of methylation, and then at completion, there was another more favorable pattern of methylation on DNA. So we, we think that we were successful in what we were hypothesizing. Of course, we need to continue to study, and, and I'll talk to you about what we're doing now. But yeah, pretty cool. It was really cool. And I love how you say, basically, the foods on your fork are information and basically telling your genes what to do which is really compelling. And the list that you gave is not a hard list to consume. And what I love about your program is you've made it really easy. So you're not asking people to whip up these complicated recipes six times a day. In fact, we were talking about your salad that you have at lunch. And so can you tell us like about how easy it can be? Some examples of how would you get more of these foods in your diet? Yeah, I have, when I'm doing the intensive, so we've got what we, our study diet is more intense than sort of the everyday that's a little bit, a little less rigorous during the intense period, which I really try to adhere to most of the time. It just works well for my body. It's a lot of veg. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's about seven to nine cups of veggies a day, but particular stuff, like we really want to make sure you're getting a plethora of these methylation adaptogens and the donors. And so there's a little, there's a cheat sheet in the book and I printed it out. You know, I copied it and printed it out, stick it on the fridge. So I just know that I'm getting a sufficient amount of protein that I'm getting my leafy greens, that I'm getting my cruciferous veg, you know, that I'm getting some beets, a little, not a lot. You don't have to get a lot. For some of us, beets are a blood sugar spike. For me, if I have too many, they're a blood sugar spike for sure. But you're just having a smattering of beets maybe two, two mediums at two different time points in a day. I want people to have fermented foods also. And these are, these are all, the whole program is very gut nourishing, but we're layering in a little bit. In the book, I started layering in fermented foods. Adequate water, good quality fats. Let's see, we have a, a gentle time-restricted eating structure, 12 on, 12 off, which somebody what it was interviewing me just referred to that as normal eating. <laughs> It's like a normal dietary pattern. You eat during the day and then you fast overnight. Something we don't do as routinely. I, it was JJ version who said that to me. Like, yeah. So there's a gentle intermittent time-restricted eating pattern in it. And basically that's it. And so for me, the easiest way to get it done, I have one main meal a day. I mean, I'm not calorically restricted, although you could do this program if you wanted to restrict your calories. That's that's doable. But I do, I, I try to bang my nutrients out in a single salad. So to your point, <laughs> I'll take those targets on my fridge and put them in a salad or take that salad and stir fry it for a little variety in the colder months and just bang out what I need to do and bring that with me to the office and just kind of nosh on it through the office through my work day. So I want to circle back to something you said earlier about, yes, we can use food to get these methyl donors like folate, B12, choline. You can also use supplements, but it really deserves a conversation about how much, when, who should take them before people would just start taking them. Can you have that conversation with us? Yeah, I can. So when we originally started this program, a piece of it was as I really kind of lighted on how powerful environment it influences epigenetic expression, gene expression. The next question was logically you know, what are we doing in functional medicine? To your point, are we doing right? Am I doing as right as I possibly can by my patients? 
taking into consideration this new kind of extraordinary science of epigenetics. And there is evidence in the literature that we can, it, no doubt about it, negatively influence epigenetics through some of our choices. I mean, we know toxin exposures, smoking, lack of exercise, all of this will absolutely have a negative weight, poor diet, and, and all of it will have a ne negative weight on gene expression. And we could see, so, so one of the biggest kind of awakenings for me on this journey was that tumor suppressor genes, genes, these are genes that produce proteins that protect us from getting cancer. Tumor suppressor genes are hijacked by the tumor microenvironment and inhibited. They are turned off so that the cancer can grow. Pre protective genes are shut down. Pro-cancer genes, oncogenes, are actually turned on. So their methyl groups are removed. They're allowed to express the cancer proliferates. Protective genes are hypermethylated and turned off. And so the cancer can proliferate. So these, both of these phenomena like reliably happen and extremely reliably happen in cancer. I mean, we use methylation patterns for cancer diagnostics. I mean, it's, it's pretty extraordinary where we're going in this arena using DNA methylation patterns to look at different diseases, including cancer. So I talk about all the methyl donors that we need to, to keep methylation happening. And the obvious question for me as a clinician is, well, if I give my patients B12 and folate, if I give them the classic methyl donors in high doses, in isolated synthetic vitamins, could I be driving this negative pattern? Could I support, could I prompt a patient that has maybe a precancerous yet to be identified condition in negatively changing epigenetic expression? So could B vitamins actually be detrimental in cer under certain conditions? And I think that the answer, I think there's sufficient evidence in the literature for the answer to be, yeah, you know, under certain conditions, B vitamins are, are contraindicated. Now, under certain conditions, B vitamins are absolutely essential and life-saving. In fact, there's more science on that. There's more science on a deficit of these nutrients and the associated fallout. So we need to be, we need this information that B vitamins provide, particularly B12 and folate provide. We need them. We need it. But the best way to get that information is from a whole food, plant-dense, but not exclusively plants, diet liver happens to be a multivitamin in a food matrix. So it's incredibly bioavailable and it's dense with nutrients. There's no evidence in the literature that this whole food plant dense diet causes aberrant DNA methylation patterns, negative DNA methylation pattern at all. Like there's no evidence that, you know, a big bowl of kale is going to push cancer forward or broccoli. In fact, the opposite is true. So... <laughs> Yeah, at the worst, some of these are neutral, like they show no benefit or, no, you know, but really, they're, by and large, the overwhelming evidence is that these foods are incredibly important and incredibly beneficial. So we know we need methyl donors, but taking them as many as we can in a food context, in the food as, as information context, I think is the safest, smartest way to go. On top of that, if we as clinicians see that our patient needs extra bioidentical but synthetic folate or B12 for the reason that we've identified, then we layer that in. But we give it being mindful of the dosage and the duration. And maybe we're more careful in people who are older, who may have precancerous conditions. So I think we should use these nutrients with an awareness of how potent they are. And always, always, always couple them with the methylation adaptogens, those traffic directors, the other collection of epinutrients that will help direct where methylation happens, where that folate and B12, you know, the, the methyl group that they ultimately make, the methyl groups, that, where they go. So take those together. I think that's the kind of the safest, prudent, most prudent way. Food first, food as much as possible, layer in the additional nutrients as needed, but layer them in mindfully. Beautiful. Yeah, I think it's clear from your book that like getting the right amount is important. So not just blindly taking supplements, knowing that there is such a thing as too little and that's harmful and also knowing that there is such a thing as too much. There's clear U curve. You know, in science, we call that a U curve. So too little is negative, too much is negative. You want that bottom of the U, that sweet spot. 
you have a very similar approach to exercise that you have to nutrition, in my opinion, which is, you know, you might feel a little scared when you start to read this book, you're thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to have to stop eating everything I love? And you very quickly realize, oh no, actually this is reasonable. Same thing with exercise. I feel like sometimes people get really scared thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to have to do in the gym? Am I going to need to be in the gym 90 minutes a day? And the exercise program that you prescribe in the book seems like it's a few days a week, 30 minutes a day, 60% intensity. Can you talk to us about how you think people should think about exercise in the context of aging and what really is effective for helping people to reverse biological age? Yeah, yes. So my thinking has evolved from when we first developed this program. We first developed this program in 2016. So it's been a minute, you know, and we've used it in clinical practice for many years. And we're also studying it and we're also paying attention to the research. This core program has shown in our two publications to reverse biological age. I think the core program is a good starting point for all of us. Like we can all do that exercise prescription, 30 minutes minimum, five days a week. You get to figure out your perceived exertion. You know, you don't need a Fitbit. You don't need a aura ring or, you know, a heart rate monitor, a polar heart rate. You don't need any of that. Go do and do what you want. You know, my mom gardens for her exercise. Sometimes she'll tool around her block. My sister walks with her friends and they're yapping away. You know, I'm a cyclist. I like to do a bunch of different, I like going to the gym and all of this, but fundamentally my favorite activity is, is biking. And so we do what we like. We get our heart rates up to 60%, which is just a light sweat. I mean, this is not hardcore. And we do that for at least 30 minutes. And that's the entry. Now, there's a strong argument for layering as we're ready more intense exercise into that journey and paying attention to our muscle mass and all of that. So these are things that I'm thinking about now. And I recently had my VO2 max done and I pay attention to my muscle mass. I want it to be on the high side. I want to be at the upper percentile for my age. I want to make sure I'm doing that. And when we're ready, we can adopt these things. And we're going to talk about the younger you training, but in that context, I'll be over the course of maybe this year, or next year, et cetera. I'll be unrolling some of my thoughts here. Recently, I published a blog on drcarefitzgerald.com on protein. One of our nutrition interns and I wrote it just on how to layer a higher protein diet into the younger you principles to support muscle mass. And I talk about how I do that. So I'll, hi I'll toggle higher protein days in my dietary pattern, kind of associated with when I'm lifting and that kind of thing. So Baseline intervention, do it, follow it. We're showing that it works. And it's a great way to enter into the taking charge of your health, like in an incredibly powerful way that we've tested. And then if you are so inclined, there's next levels that we can that we can layer in. So, okay, hang on a second. Sounds like you're lifting. Are you powerlifting? What are you doing these days? Well, I just got back from the gym here in Mexico, actually. I did cut I did kettleballs and what else did I do? Kettlebells. Yeah, just like did some curls and stuff like that. Yeah, I did some presses. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do? Stuff like, yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like you were a biker. Are you getting more into lifting now? I am both. I'm both. I've always lifted weights. I've always lifted weights because cycling, I was a, a sprinter, you know, when I was a competitive athlete. Like I was one of those people with big legs, which I still. I still had pretty reasonably big legs, but I was one of those cyclists who had big muscles. I wasn't like the skinny scamper up the hill cyclist. So I've always been somebody who's kind of had that body habitus, a more muscular body habitus. And I supported that with weightlifting. And I actually hurt my knees when I was young and had to focus on building my quad. So I became, I, in my early 20s, I was sensitive to the benefit of good muscle mass and knee support and all of that. So, it's, so lifting has always been there. It's always been there in the background, but I have done it with a little bit more intentionality recently and a little more attention to, you know, proteins to support it. But I would say if I had to choose one, I would choose riding my bike. <laughs> but, you know, if you power up a hill and, and it, I mean, if you're really pushing the gear, that is resistance training. I mean, just 100 percent. So I want to know, you have a new program where you're training clinicians to use the Younger You protocol in practice. Can you tell us all about this program? Yeah, it's the 
the Younger You program for trade for clinicians. Actually, you guys are working with us on this project. So it's been a, it's, I have wanted since the launch of this program, we launched it in 2016. Before I wrote the book, before we did the study, we created a white paper on this dietary pattern and lifestyle intervention geared to the professional and released it at IFM. Romilly Hodges and I did a presentation at, I, at the 2016 Annual International Conference on this program, attended by just a few people. <laughs> it was under the radar for, for, for quite a few years, but we were, were using it in practice and we were pretty excited about the possibility. Certainly when we got funding, Metagenics gave us an unrestricted grant to study it. And when we saw that we were reversing bioage with it, it's gotten a lot more attention. And it's been my desire that clinicians are able to do this, that that we make available the fundamental Younger You program for people to use in practice. It's as simple as that for people to take it and correctly administer it or components of it to their patients, just as we've been doing in our practice, they, or use it in for their patients in a patient group setting, you know, like we're doing in our practice. I, I really wanted to make that available. And so we're doing it. You know, we're going to, we're launching it. You guys are generously and importantly supporting us in this journey as you have in a lot of things that we've done. And you're, you're, you're making it easier for healthcare providers to be able to get the biological age testing that we recommend in this and the other functional medicine testing actually that, you know, we use in functional medicine or root cause medicine. So I'm super, super excited about it. It's we're, we're launching next month. Do you have the dates? Yeah, I do. February 14th and 15th of 2024. It's going to be a two webinar extravaganza. Attend it. It's available free in that live setting. So you have to attend it to, to get it. And then you can purchase, if you want to, the recordings and you can get certified that certification of attendance and some other goodies. Actually, we have a ton of support material that we've developed over the years, many years, not just for the book, not just for the research study, but just having used this in clinical practice for so long. So we've do, so we have all of that on the back end available to people. So this is taking the program that we've been using in the research setting and in our clinic and launching it to clinicians out there totally for free. I think if people are psyched about this, we will continue with it in a module structure. That's something that you know I'm thinking about and would kind of like to do. Like for instance, using a higher protein structure, thinking about muscle, muscle mass and layering in younger you principles. You know, just sort of the you know, the next generation and what kind of exercise is appropriate and appropriately layered into younger you. So we all need this foundation and we're making it available for you, actually. I think that we have a couple of others. I think True Diagnostic also will be there sponsoring us as you know, we use, we, we recommend them and use their, their testing now in our clinical practice now that we don't have to go through the research in the research setting for this. And yeah, we want it to be available. We're excited. I'm thrilled. I mean, I can't wait to meet the clinicians, the healthcare providers who will be with us at this training. I'm, I'm super, super excited. God, I've wanted to do this really for years. It's so generous. It really is. I, I think it's unprecedented almost. It's like you're giving away not only your secrets, but your resources. When you say sleep, I know folks are going to think, oh, I know I should be getting my eight hours. Is there something different you want people to know about sleep? Sleep has gotten a lot of attention. I think there's some good science around sleep coming out, the implications of insufficient sleep and adequate sleep, lots of data around that. So we know that if we're not sleeping well, all of those chronic diseases of aging that we talked about at the beginning of this podcast are at increased risk of developing. So insufficient sleep is a driver of those collection of all the chronic diseases. And, you know, again, the acute things like COVID and influenza and so forth, like sleep is that incredibly fundamental. And we need to be getting balanced, you know, sufficient deep, sufficient REM, et cetera. I don't think that we just need, we stop at eight hours. In fact, I think if you get a good solid seven hours with a reasonable distribution, it if you're tracking, like I happen to have an aura ring on, so I know what my deep sleep is and, and that kind of, yeah, a lot of us do, which I, I love it. I think it's a helpful tool. So, I mean, I would just, I would just say that, you know, we want to 
pay attention to optimizing the conditions for us to achieve sleep. I, I paid a lot of a good sleep. I paid a lot of attention in the book on sleep because my own, of all of the elements of our program, sleep was my weak link for sure. Especially with a little, with a baby at home. God, my sleep was profoundly disrupted for a while. And I felt like I trained for good sleep, like I was training for a marathon, just really kind of figuring out the hacks that worked for me. And I go through all of those. One of the basic fundamental hack is, of course, we know, you know, no caffeine after the morning and latest at noon, but having enough runway to achieve sleep. Many of us go to bed too late and then we need to get up at a certain time. Or if you've got a kid, you're getting up whether you like it or not. You know, so having enough runway to achieve sleep, like that was one of the biggest ahas for me. I was going to bed way late to give myself any fighting chance to get, you know, seven hours. What? Room darkening. I mean, again, super easy and it can make a huge difference. I didn't talk about it in the book. I wasn't like excited about amount of taping, but I've since come to really appreciate it, recommend it and use it myself sometimes as well. Um, keeping my mouth shut, making sure I'm breathing through my nose has made a huge difference for me in my sleep. So there's a bunch of, you know, there's just a bunch of good hacks that I cover in the book. And I'm already sort of thinking beyond what I might teach on in this younger you 2.0, but yeah, good sleep will reduce risk of disease and poor sleep will drive risk of disease. And it will do so through altering DNA methylation patterns. It will do so through epigenetics. And it's free, which is great. And it's like really no side effects, just side benefits. It's also, I love that you talk about it all because from my point of view, someone who was so focused on food as medicine and nutrients in my practice, that I became familiar very quickly with the science around short sleep and micronutrient deficiencies. So we know that things like iron deficiency anemia are very linked with what's called very short sleep. So under five hours. So maybe you are someone who goes to bed at nine or 10, you're like, I'm giving myself the runway. And then you're up at three and you can't fall back asleep. That's called a very short sleep pattern. Those are associated sometimes with micronutrient deficiencies. They can be. And so I think when you do it all, you get the benefits of everything all at once. When you have a replete diet, it will help you sleep better. When you sleep better, you have better gut health. You can absorb your nutrients better. And so doing it all at once in a way that's easy and sustainable is so effective. And it's just the cycle that feeds on itself in a beautiful way. And what do you do when you have that 3 a.m. wake up and how do you get yourself back to sleep? That was something that I was going through actually all the time because Isabella was, was up. So yeah, I talk about that. Meditations that work and calming patterns, rain, you know, white noise, et cetera. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of hacks out there that can be very effective. And to your point, like augmenting cortisol, looking at our exercise patterns and more stress response before bed, screen time. Yeah. There's just, there's a ton of micro hacks that will add up to ultimately allowing us to achieve good sleep. Do you have a favorite meditation or mindfulness practice? We use Herbert Benson relaxation response. That's it's in the book. That's what we use in our study. He's, he was a Harvard scientist studying meditation. At the time, meditation was a little bit woo-woo, so he termed it the relaxation response. I think we've come back to being able to call it meditation, but it's just a good basic breathing structure, and he's, it's been used in countless clinical trials. And so we, we use that in our research. I personally use something from the University of Wisconsin, the Healthy Minds app. It's free. It's free. I actually donate to them periodically because, you know, that's how they sustain and keep it free. And it just, it has a bunch of different meditations on it and all of them are free. And there's a good, yeah, if I wake up too early, you know, I've got a nice one that I'll just pop on and it will, if I stay centered with it, it'll just bring me right back to sleep. I, they've got, a, they've got some awesome micro meditations, like literally a minute long. So when people say they can't meditate, which many do, or they don't have time for meditation, or they don't like meditating. I mean, there's micro meditation. There is a, there's an entry into this conversation that all of us can have. And I've used their micro meditations many times. When I, when I was, the book tour for, for Younger You was intense. Like it was actually really pretty relentless. I remember vividly, and a lot, but a lot of it was in my office because we were still sort of in the COVID era somewhat and things had changed how you do interviews. And I would be in my office like all day long, just giving a, and just a dump of interviews, like nonstop, sitting in my car doing one of these micro meditations, just this micro breathing meditation and just 
you know, it bringing me down. It was so helpful. I mean, I love it. There's a lot of apps out there, Calm, and, you know, there's just, there's a zillion of them, but I, I, I just, I have a warm spot for healthy minds because it's totally free. And they study it and they study it. You know, they're researching it over at the University of Wisconsin. They're researching the benefits of meditation really very carefully. So I just, I think they're cool. What they're doing is really neat. For the parents at home who are identifying with what you said about wanting to slow down your biological aging for your kids, but who might be feeling daunted by like, well, how do I do all of this on top of my already busy life with my kids, with my job? I love that you can share this with your family. You can share these things with your loved ones. So these are meditations that you can do with your kids and teaching your kids to meditate is going to have profound implications for their health. So for someone who might be starting to feel overwhelmed thinking about the list of things you need to start doing or add to your life or that you want to start doing, invite your loved ones into these practices with you. So cook together, move together, meditate together. The two Katie's at my work have been doing yoga for 79 days together because 79 days ago, they both decided they needed to do yoga and they both like send each other little short yoga videos to do every morning and they keep each other accountable. They're both healthier. They're both happier. They're closer. So these practices can enrich your relationships and can be done in the context of relationship. And that's another thing that I really love about your program is it can be used for the whole family. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And there's so many epinutrients also, like for people who are intimidated about starting, which you're right, there are plenty of people just look at it as this difficult pattern without actually getting into the specifics of it. Look in the appendix, take a highlighter. You'll see that you're already eating. You're already doing a lot right. And you can lean on that. You can lean in on that. And then, yeah, to your point, community. Actually, you know, there's, there's some really cool research on community and exercise. There, It's suggested that engaging in community sports or more longevity promoting than solo sports, which is really interesting. I know it's so fascinating. It's out of Mayo. I remember reading research about patient reported outcomes in Parkinson's. And when people would answer yes to the, to the statement, I am lonely, they were likely to be basically progressing with their Parkinson's symptoms at a much faster rate than people who said, I'm not lonely. And that's medicine from your friends and family in your community. And it's powerful just because it doesn't come in a pill or prescription doesn't mean it's not powerful. So I love everything you've said today. I and the entire team at Rupa Health are so proud and honored to be part of the Younger You training program for clinicians that you are offering for free in February. If you're listening to this podcast now, that means you still have time to go sign up. We will have the link in the show notes or just Google it. But thank you, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, for being here with us today and for the work you're doing in the world. Absolutely. It's always great to get to hang out with you, Kate. Likewise. We'll see you soon. All right. Ciao, ciao.